Welcome to Aotearoa Tomorrow. I'm your host, Arthur Falls. Today we're joined by Paul Spoonley, a researcher focused on social cohesion, the sense of connection that binds together the many people that call New Zealand home. Part of Paul's work involves understanding how to welcome migrants into this nation without undermining the sense of cultural security of those already here. For reasons we'll understand soon, that's quite an important issue. He's focused on the type of violent extremism that fueled the Christchurch shootings and the fracturing of the nation as a result of COVID policy. According to Paul, trust in our nation, both between individual people and between people, companies, and the government, is in decline. He describes being surprised by the public's lack of engagement with political media this election, and there is likely a connection to be drawn between this lack of engagement and decline in trust. The big question that I brought Paul on to answer is how do politicians and governments affect social cohesion for better or worse, and how should we translate this into our expectations of our politicians' behaviour? This flows on to these questions about trust. We digress into identifying how the Productivity and Infrastructure Commissions have 30-year planning horizons, but this planning is not translated into policy, as politicians prefer to focus on what sounds good for voters. He also sees the need to bring representative diversity into institutions to rebuild trust. I feel like there's a tie-in to the co-governance discussion here. Paul is very interested in the declining fertility of the New Zealand population and how this is happening at the same time as our population grows rapidly due to immigration and the risk this combination of trends poses to social cohesion, given that our public infrastructure is already overstrained. Finally, we dig into the need for greater media literacy on the part of the New Zealand public. Although, if I'm honest, I'm not 100% satisfied that we reach a satisfactory conclusion. But we do break the surface, and that lines us up for future episodes. I had some audio issues with this one. Nothing too serious, though, and it gets better further on. Um, all right. Oh, look at this. It's perfectly set up. Thanks for joining me, Paul. Um, oh, fair. I'll do my intro. Um, always fumble it right at the start. I edit this heavily, by the way. So, Yes, kia ora, Arthur. Um, so... I was the lead on a major research program looking at migration and settlement and diversity called Capturing the Diversity Dividend. And that was a six and a half million dollar multi-year, uh, multi-institutional project. But I was also uh, asked in 2005 to help write a cabinet paper on social cohesion. And then more recently, I've joined the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in Victoria University as um, with Hei Whenua Tarikura um, and the uh, Hei Whenua Tarikura is for countering violent extremism uh, but it also has within its terms of reference and its mission statement uh, the need to build social cohesion and so I've been working with Sir Peter Gluckman and the, the team at Koi2 and we've produced three reports on social cohesion. So could you explain what social cohesion is? Yes, it, it's, it's really about the level of trust in a society and about the inclusion and participation of people. And it's about having policies which help include and integrate various communities. So we, like many other countries, have become super diverse. Uh, our migration policy has changed since the 1980s and we are now one of the most super diverse countries in the world with a significant indigenous population. And that um, ethnic and religious and other forms of diversity, what binds us together? What brings us together? And so that's what social cohesion is. And we would tend to talk about social and institutional trust. And we would tend to use a Canadian framework which has five components to it, belonging, inclusion, participation, recognition, and legitimacy. So when I did that original work in 2005, the Canadians, as far as I was concerned, were the most advanced in terms of talking about social cohesion. And what we borrowed from the Canadians in 2005-06, we continue to use in terms of contemporary social inclusion and social cohesion in New Zealand. So what are the broader 
societal consequences of failing social cohesion? Well, it depends when we're talking about, Arthur. So the original reason for looking at social cohesion in 2005 and 2006 was because we'd had a big wave of migrants after 2000. And the government was concerned that we really needed to ensure that migrants felt welcomed and settled here and that communities in the country also were feeling that migration was good. By the way, the cabinet paper wasn't uh, accepted. And then, of course, we had the shooting in 2019 in Christchurch, and the Royal Commission brought back social cohesion onto the agenda, and we've been working on it. And, of course, the, the thing that not only is it in response to what happened in Christchurch, but it's also in response to what happened during um, COVID. And, and, and we've done three reports. One was early in 2020. And at that point, the response in New Zealand uh, towards the public health measures uh, was very high. In other words, people complied. And so our social cohesion was really exemplary in terms of what was happening around the world during a pandemic. But that cohesion is unraveled as the pandemic rolled on. And of course, by the time we had the parliamentary protests in early 22 at Parliament, um, we could see that there were fractures and that social cohesion wasn't, uh, wasn't what it was in the early stages of, of the pandemic. And along with many other countries, we've just seen a decline in trust and the trust in government, the trust in the media, the trust in, in, in a lot of our core institutions. And so we have a problem at the moment. And the problem is that we have low social trust. We have low institutional trust and we've then got the added components or the added issues of mis and disinformation. Well, there's quite a lot to unpack there <clears throat> and I think a big part of it is really, I mean from my perspective as a layman, these do not seem like trustworthy institutions, right? Like the vaccine mandates were really alarming for a lot of people. I mean a lot of people lost their jobs. That was seen as a massive breach of trust uh, by the government of, you know, of the public's trust. And then we've seen with uh, the RNZ scandal that um, we can't trust the media. And I think what I really took away from the Radio New Zealand scandal, this is where one of the, um, one of the journalists was altering uh, press releases from the Associated Press and other, um, other external media organizations before publishing them in such a way that it included what was perceived to be Russian propaganda, although I'm fairly certain that that journalist believed that, in fact, what those press releases represented was US or some other kind of propaganda, and he felt like he was doing a service to New Zealand uh, from shielding them from it. I'm not 100% sure, but that is that would be my natural interpretation. And I feel like, A, that demonstrates that there are members of the journalistic community, this guy in particular, um, who don't trust the journalistic apparatus itself globally. And also it demonstrated, because this was so brazen and went on for such a long time, it demonstrated to me that no one really reads the news, like there aren't people closely reading this stuff. It should have been overturned really rapidly. You would just have to read the Associated Press and also RNZ, and obviously no one's doing that. So... I wonder, you know, it feels like these institutions genuinely aren't trustworthy, or at least not sufficiently trustworthy for the position they propose to hold in society. Yes. And, and, and when we look at trust in New Zealand, the media, uh, the level of trust is lowest for the media. It's low for governments, it's low for politicians, but it is low for the media. And I think we've lost that sense that these core institutions are doing a good job and that the example that you used, which was the altering of um, content, um, should have had checks and balances in it. Now, I would counterpose that, Arthur, with the, the multiplicity of social media sites which have contributed alternative views of the world, of inst international institutions, of local institutions. And 
in the last three to five years, what we've seen is the significant uptake of those alternative and often conspiratorial views. So we take examples of the sort that you've used and, and see that the media is complicit in something, the media is misrepresenting something. And, and I've got to say that during this general election, I've been, I've been struck by how little... Um, the general public have engaged in the political process and in the um, in the media versions of it. So there's been suspicion, you know, of, of misrepresenting, of bias, of, of of various forms of distrust in the media. So you're right, and I think the question for us is, what do our core institutions look like? Because when we look at the multiplicity of um, sites then we quickly get into conspiratorial views and misrepresenting um, uh, what is occurring in the world, what is occurring in our world, and um, how do we rebuild that trust. The Edelman Trust Barometer came out a few months ago, and that's an international assessment of trust around 40 countries, mostly high-income countries. And what you see is the decline in trust in all of those countries. So the trust in, in, in core institutions like the media has gone down in New Zealand, but not as much as other countries such as the USA. And so the USA, um, Sweden, a number of other countries are seen as being very fractured, very um, divided, and with very low trust. Now, New Zealanders' trust has gone down, but not to the same extent. And the final thing to say about the Edelman Trust Barometer is that what you see is that around two-thirds of people answering the questions around the world, around these 40 countries, believe that the social fabric of countries, of um, societies has declined and they just don't have faith that that social fabric is there to help us come out of the pandemic, come out of the sort of economic crisis that we're seeing. So social cohesion generally has declined. Social cohesion in New Zealand has declined. And at the core of it is the lack of trust. So I guess uh, there's two questions I want to follow on from that. And one is I'm not 100% clear what you, what the consequences of declining social cohesion is. I get that there's a relationship between trust and social cohesion, but the symptoms of declining social cohesion are unclear to me, although although there may be some reciprocal effect with uh, trust, institutional trust, and uh, and interpersonal trust within a country. But then also this idea of the social fabric. So let me let me deal with the social fabric to begin with. We're really talking about our core institutions, but also our communities. So because we've become much more diverse, as I indicated before, ethnically. Um, in terms of our faith, in terms of our gender identity, and so on. What are the core institutions that bring us together and allow us to have discussions about things that are of central importance? Now, in the past, they would have been the media. But as you saw a couple of weeks ago, when the uh, latest figures came out, the, the, the audience put, um, participation, the audience um, consumption of our major media sources have all gone down. And so we've got quite significant parts of our community who are not participating in our mainstream media, our television ones or our Radio New Zealand's or our Heralds or, or, or Posts. So that's the, the question about fabric, I think, is an important one. And my argument would be that in a digital age, and if we're talking about active citizenship, if we're talking about things that bring us together, we probably need to think about what those institutions look like and they probably don't look like what they were five years ten years or twenty years ago so you know for me digital literacy is quite important uh, being able to participate online respectfully to disagree respectfully is important in terms of the symptoms what we've seen is a growing polarization and a politicization and so as you saw during the COVID, and you've mentioned the the mandates which were probably one of the most divisive uh, developments, because up to that point, you know, we'd we'd seen basically 
uh, the majority of the population adhering to the COVID um, pandemic requirements. And, and we, what we did was we used Google Map data to look at this. And so we could tell whether people were doing non-essential shopping, whether they were going to parks. And, and if you took something like non-essential um, shopping, um, essentially somewhere between 80 and 90% of people in New Zealand adhered to that requirement. So they did essential shopping, but didn't do non-essential shopping. Whereas if you went to Australia, that figure would be 10 to 15% lower. By the time you got to the United States, it would be 60%, 50 to 60% lower. So, you know, th th there was compliance, but the mandates brought that in. But what we've seen is that as we've become more divided, the polarisation of New Zealanders um, has grown. And you can see that during the election campaign, the disruption of meetings, the attacks on people. And I see something called the digital harm log, which the Department of Internal Affairs produce. And so the online abuse, the online vitriol, the online attacks, the online threats has all gone up in the last three to five years. And it's, it's, it's quite a significant issue for countries around the world and ourselves included. When I look at um, political parties like, uh, or political movements like uh, Groundswell or the Freedom and Rights Association, I see these organisations that speak to uh, a frustration in the population with perceived neglect from uh, governmental institutions. Groundswell has a really clear case. If we apply a whole bunch of environmental re regulation on farmers and primary producers, you make it more expensive, and so the little guy has to sell up. It gets consolidated into, into uh, large corporate holdings. And it's not a far leap to assume that those big corporations are promoting this environmentalist agenda that will that leads to uh, that lobbies for increased environmental regulation because it benefit benefits them, and so there's this. It's easy to see where these conspiracies kind of come from. Also, if you're say part of um, Brian Tamaki's Destiny Church, or, or more religious traditional family values oriented movement. It's easy to see how this inclusion of um, gender diversity in you know, youth education can be seen as eroding what they perceive to be the fundamental atom of society or of the social fabric, as you describe it, which is the traditional um, heterosexual nuclear family. And so I can see where these things are coming from. And I guess what I'm not clear on is how we're supposed to integrate these very reasonable concerns into our um, political discourse without it turning into this highly vitriolic um, online climate. And, and you're right. I think that um, th there's, a, there's a very very good book by Ali Hochschild, which talked about this in the United States, that people felt disempowered, they felt ignored, they felt as though policies were going in a direction which excluded them. And so we get this proliferation of, of fringe political parties, because even though you, Arthur, have described them as being as representing a voice, and they should have a voice in the community, they're still very much a minority. Um, and what I think you're going to see is that uh, in this election that's coming up, you know, the, their, their vote will not be particularly significant. It wasn't in the last election, and I'm, I'm picking that it won't be in this election. And, and the question for me is how you then begin to, rep, you know, include those voices. How do you begin to include those voices in political decision making, in discussion? And, and that's where I think the core institutions of our society need to change and become perhaps more transparent. And that's what we've talked about in our most recent publication. Uh, I think there are things like the way in which we organise our parliament, our three-year cycle, which needs to change. I think we need to have more digital options in terms of including people in, in discussion, and that's what I would mean by active, active citizenship. The thing that I would point out is that demographically, New Zealand is changing very significantly. So that heterosexual um, male-female partnership household 
is actually been declining for about 40 to 50 years. And the fact that um, New Zealand is one of the most secular societies, so our um, non-religious communities, people who don't identify with a, a faith or a, a church, um, is now the majority of New Zealanders. So I think part of this is that um, people are reacting to changes which are occurring anyway. It, it has nothing to do really with um, with our politics. It's it's really part of our demography. And and if I could give you a couple of things to, to hook off. So our fertility has dropped in the last um, five to six years to well below replacement level, which means 2.1 births per woman, by the way, is replacement level. So... When I say below replacement level, it's now at 1.6. So our fertility is continuing to go down. So I'm a baby boomer. When I was born, uh, it was 4.3 births per woman in New Zealand. It's now 1.6. So there's there's the the way in which society is changing is significantly influenced by our demography. So I, my generation's ageing. We're going to get a lot, lot more um, people aged over 65. A quarter of our population are going to be aged over 65. When I was growing up, it was 8%. So that, some, of those, some of those groups that you talk about are harking back to a New Zealand which might have existed some time ago but isn't going to exist again and can't be called back. It, it's not as though some of these are going to be reversed. So when I talk about fertility, no country has yet discovered the key to increasing fertility. So this is a great example of an inexorable force that changes society, people react to, and presumably that is that change is a driver of instability, uh, let's say emotional instability, and a sense of alienation from your own society, and that itself leads to uh, a lack of social cohesion, a lack of trust in uh, institutions that you may perceive to be responsible for these for these changes or related changes. So I can see all of that. But how can politicians, uh, knowing that this is going on, uh, knowing that we are experiencing this um, this uh, fraying social fabric and social cohesion, how can they make a positive difference? Because um, I watch, you know. You know, we presumably both watched the um, the political debates, and Chris Hipkins brought up um, some pretty intense racist perspectives that had been um, raised by the uh, by New Zealand First. And I also noticed, on a totally unrelated, you know, non racial um, perspective, the idea of institutions being broken was that particular word broken was brought up on a number of occasions and that seemed to me to be particularly unproductive it's like to say are the police broken is the health system broken it's like i can go to the doctor it takes a while to get an appointment but i can still go to the doctor i wouldn't call it broken um and so that that may be offensive to some people i was being flippant there but it seemed fundamentally unproductive the way that some of these issues were being addressed, even in that safe environment or, you know, controlled environment. And then it was interesting to see New Zealand First allowing such uh, vitriolic racist rhetoric to be elevated. Yes. And, and, and I think it's partly about our political culture, Arthur, that, um, you know, what I would really like us to see and what we've argued for is for a coming together of the major political parties at least to agree that there are some issues that are so important that we need cross-party support and we need to have a conversation about what that would entail. Um, and, and we've seen these sorts of things unravel. The three waters would be a, a case in point. I don't think the government explains three waters particularly well. But if we look at our media at the moment, if we look at the contamination of, of water in Auckland through sewerage, if we look at um, uh, cryptosporidium in, in Queenstown, if we, if we look at people around the country that are having to boil water, water safety is fundamental to our country. And what are we going to do to preserve that water safety? Now, I, I think there are, I think I'm critical. I'm critical that we've got a three-year government cycle 
which doesn't do long-term planning, which doesn't allow or encourage long-term planning. I would like us to talk about what's going to happen in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 30 years. And the Productivity Commission and the Infrastructural Commission have got a 30-year time horizon. But I don't see that material being translated into policy. So what I think is going on is that politicians and political parties are doing uh, focus groups and they're talking to you and I and they're saying, well, we don't want to do this and we don't want to do that without showing leadership and without showing that long-term vision and for it to be evidence-based. So I've given you an example today of fertility decline. Are we talking about it? No, we're not. Are we talking about the very high rates of inward migration and net migration? It looks as though it's going to be 100,000 this year. We've never had a net migration rate of 100,000. And so there are these big demographic and economic and social changes which are occurring, which need good evidence. We need to know what's happening. We need to understand what the policy options are. And we need then to have a political discussion. But I don't see I don't see politicians talking about these things on a long term basis. It's it's about getting elected uh, in a general election, not about the long term issues that we've you and I have just been canvassing. And this entire event or series of events that's taking place right now seems to be stressing our society uh, increasingly, or stressing the social fabric and the um, and social cohesion. What we need to acknowledge, I think, is that we've got some very significant demographic and social and economic changes occurring. There are people who are feeling alienated and left out, who are feeling anxious, uh, who are feeling fragile. And, and what we need to do is have the opportunity to talk to them about what is happening. I mean, I, I, I talk about demography a lot, and I talk about it in the ways that sound alarming. You know, the, the ageing of the population, the dropping fertility, the very high immigration rates, the fact that regions in New Zealand are, uh, are very different in terms of what they're experiencing at the moment. But all of those have got options. Once we understand the issues, I think we begin to get less fragile and less anxious. And, and then all of them have got policy options around what could happen. And I'm a great believer in community up rather than government down. So when I talk about social cohesion, one of the things that I would emphasise is that we learned out of that pandemic is that unless communities are involved, social cohesion is not going to work. It's not something a government can say, this is what social cohesion looks like, this is what you should do. It's something that communities will do if they're encouraged to do it, but it's something that communities will do. So I see it as a bottom-up issue. And, and what I'd like to do is to see more communities having a voice, more communities participating, more communities being recognised, and bringing those very different community experiences and voices together. But the question, Arthur, is how do we do that? I mean, where, do we, where are we going to do that? And, and I think what you've highlighted is that in the current political campaign, it ain't happening. It's, it's, it's very adversarial, it's very polarising, and, it, and, and a lot of communities are feeling very disengaged and very concerned about what is occurring in terms of a political process. So that's my challenge, I think. That's, that's the challenge that we've highlighted in these social cohesion reports. We need to change our institutions. We need to change how we relate to one another. We need... Well, I'm going to use the word active citizenship. We need people to participate in, in some of these discussions. So what does that look like? It doesn't look like what we're currently doing, I think. And it doesn't certainly look like what we were doing 10 years ago. And, and I think we've been talking about government. But in fact, a lot of this is actually not government. I mean, you know, you talked before about um, uh, um, the agricultural sector and, and groundswell. And... One of the things we've got to acknowledge is the corporatisation of farming in New Zealand. That's not a government thing. If you think of the dairy sector, you know, those are big farms milking a lot of cows and costing a lot of money to buy. And one of the things we've done is look at, well, who's going to buy those dairy farms? Because we've got a lot of people that look like me 
sort of aging, and 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 we have assets including uh, our dairy farms, and even if we look at something like the housing market, if we look at the under thirty fives um, getting into the housing market, we've seen it drop significantly, and it's going to go below fifty percent. Whereas at one point it was between seventy and eighty percent of people who were under 35 who actually had bought a house, even if they owned considerable debt on that house. So one of the things we, we should acknowledge is that some of this is occurring despite government. Some of this is occurring in, in environments outside of government. Um, you know, in terms, of the, in terms of the media, we've seen a proliferation of media uh, sites, and, <laughs> including yours. And, and so we, 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 we've... we've got to look at everything in its complexity and that's hard for people people want simple answers they want simple slogans they want to say something as you said before is broken and we can fix it well most of the institutions you mentioned like health education are very complex systems they've got lots of people in them they've got lots of moving parts in them so i'm very suspicious of slogans and i'm very suspicious of anybody who says to me I can fix it, and I can fix it easily. Um, I don't think many of these issues can be fixed easily, and I think we need to invest in them. We need to talk about how we're going to change things, how we're going to change our participation, our, our sense of belonging in this country. Those are at the core of social cohesion. Well, there was there's one clear example that's been taking place under Labour, and that is the advancement of co-governance. And this is, of course, derived from uh, the from the Treaty of Waitangi and the concept of Tino Ranga Tiratanga. And uh, this is actually something that's been quite controversial, but I see the importance for it when you look at the uh, the different health outcomes for for Maori. So I had a friend who. Um, who was Māori, who was injured, and went to ACC, was severely mistreated. You know, she didn't receive, you know, a minimum of um, a minimum of care, and you know, there was a that's a horrible event to go through. And I see why there's this desire and this recognition that we do have these systemic racism or structural racism built into things as elementary as our healthcare system. Labor's been trying to push this co-governance thing, a separate Māori healthcare authority, and this is an example of engaging a community but at the same time that has offended so many other people outside of that community in New Zealand that it seems like it may have been entirely counterproductive yes I, I mean I'm bemused by the um, the co-governance debate and I, I agree with you I think it's been trivialized it's been misrepresented and it's been very poorly explained so whenever I think about social change I always want to talk about how you explain that new initiative to, to people and how you address the anxieties. So, you know, whether, it, whether it's Tadao use of Māori language, whether it's the use of the word Aotearoa, whether it's the use of the, 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 the promotion of co-governance, we've got parts of our community who are deeply anxious about those, those developments. They see them as somehow taking something away from them. And yet, it's easily, um, it's easy enough to identify where co-governance has been in place and has worked really well. So if you take the Waikato River Authority, which was set up under a co-governance model in 2010, and has worked really, really well. So what do we do about that anxiety? How do we address that anxiety? And so I think the co-governance um, debate has really unraveled quite spectacularly and and what do we do next what do we what do we do to to address those inequalities that you've identified which you can see right across the board justice education health you know there are different outcomes for maori there are different outcomes for pacifica and we've got political parties saying we should not have race based um initiatives in this country or race-based institutions. But if that leaves a group who have poor health outcomes, to use your example, continuing to experience those poor health outcomes, 
then is that contributing to social cohesion? And I'd, I would argue not. If if there is a need in the community, let's identify that need and let's address that need. We are having a hard time having a lot of conversations and a lot of conversations that we need to have. As you say, uh, our political parties are not lo planning long term. They're trying to appease voters in the short term. This is leading to um, voter disengagement because we're not actually solving the problems that we that we want to see solved. I mean, classic example being capital gains tax, Labor suggested they might do one, but technically if you go back and look at their rhetoric, they didn't commit to it. And they managed to get something through with the, um, with the bright line test. And now National wants to roll that back. And it feels like we're spinning our wheels and it doesn't make a difference. And I can say personally, um, you know, I, I don't really feel I'm on the fence about whether or not I'll, even vote this election because it seems like a waste of time. Arthur, you need you do need to vote. You do need to vote, but there's a lot of people like you. Yeah, you know, I mean, I will, but I, it just, I'm pissed off about the whole thing, you know. And I mean, that's that's why I'm that's why we're here talking. Um, and I think it's great to hear that you've got at least a call to action, and that is to engage communities. And I suppose those could be geographically co-located, or they could be. Um, ethnic or social or other kind of communities, religious, um, and actually those communities need to get together and, and um, engage with institutions, presumably as a group, because as individuals, it doesn't seem like we're, it doesn't seem like we're recognized as anything other than a demographic by the, um, by the current political institutions. Yeah. No, no, and I agree with that. And, and it's one of the challenges of a liberal democracy. You know, if you, if you go back 50 years, the major political parties were it. You know, it was a two-party system, really. I mean, there were, there were minor groups like Social Credit. And, and each of those political parties had a very large uh, membership base. But if, if you look at what's happening at the moment, the membership base is very small. The political parties themselves are quite tribal. They're quite... You know, within the parties, there are, there are different factions. And, and, and there's this tendency for some to move to the middle and for others to move to the, to the, to the extremes, really, to the fringes. And, and, and it feels very fractured. It feels very um, unsatisfactory. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're Labour, you voted Labour or National, I, I, um, New Zealand First, Act Green... I suspect if you asked all of those constituencies, they'd all be saying the same thing. A sort of feeling of dissatisfaction, a feeling that we're really not hearing uh, politicians talk about the things that are important to us, or they're not providing um, sufficient policy platforms that would appeal to, to people across these various, um, this various spectrum, this wide spectrum. So it's a bit of a challenge. I mean, if you're sitting there as one of the Chris's or as uh, Winston or, uh, you know, James or, or, or David, it is a problem because, you know, you can appeal to your particular base, but you're probably not saying anything which is going to attract others uh, um, across the spectrum. And if that diversity is going to be what our societies look like, how do we bring that diversity into our core institutions? How do we increase the trust? And I feel at times that our core institutions, both private and public, don't trust many of these communities. Um, and then, of course, those communities don't trust those core institutions, both private and public, and don't trust our politicians. So I, I, I would suggest to you we're at a, I think it'll come back, but we're at a low point in that level of trust in people, and in institutions, and that's what we've got to rebuild. So that's where we that's where we should begin the conversation, Arthur. That's you know how do we rebuild that? How do we bring you and others into the debate? What sort of what sort of environments? What sort of events? What sort of institutions do we get all of those voices together and have a respectful? Because there's a deep there's lots of evidence that vitriol and hate and disrespect are really part of our political um, system at the moment. So how do we reduce, how do we, how do we reduce the level of that conversation so it's not sh so shrill and I'm not yelling at you but you're not listening to me? 
And, and how do we get people to listen? And what does that look like? How do we make them feel safe? That's, that's, that's the common challenge, I think, of liberal democracies. Well, starting with the individual, what is your advice to an individual who's listening to this and wants to actually take the absolute first step in the right direction? I think it's to become informed. And, and <laughs> that's a huge challenge, Arthur, because, you know, I, I deal with information. I develop evidence and I provide it to politicians and others. That's part of me. I, I, I produce evidence on what's happening in New Zealand social, socially, demographically, and then I provide it. And I provide it via um, your platform. I provide it via the media. And I provide it in terms of direct contact with with various institutions. I think my first step is how, how do we become informed? And, and, and the thing for me is that very often online, you and I look for confirmation bias. You, you know, you, we look for, for views that will confirm our bias. And we're not looking at alternatives. We're not listening to people who come from a different political platform to us. We're not listening. If you go back to the co-governance, you know, are we listening to those Māori voices or are we listening to those voices who are opposed to co-governance in terms of um, what they're wanting to see from a debate? And so at an individual level, I would suggest look at your information sources and try and look at information sources that might not be coming from the same position, political position, small p political posi position as you, and, 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 and inform yourself. Inform yourself about what's happening. And that's what, that's what frustrates me, is that I, I think we should have be, be having a, a discussion about population policy. But we talk a little bit about ageing, we don't talk about fertility decline, we don't talk about regional decline, and we don't talk too much about immigration, to be honest. And so the, many of the key elements are not being discussed in the public. And, and, then, we, and then we discover we're going to have population growth this year of about 2.5%, which is the OECD average is 0.6%. And so again, we're going to struggle providing services and infrastructure. So again, our roads are going to be clogged. You know, we're not have, we don't have much um, enough public transport. So again, we're seeing population growth which is going to put a lot of pressure on our public institutions and our public services. Are we having a talk about that? No, I'm not hearing it. So, it's, it, you know, let's, let's have a talk about those sorts of big, meaty um, issues that, that, that really relate to all of us. All of us, are, all of us should be interested in demography. I know we're not, but I think all of us should be. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd add um, I'd add poverty to that um, to that list of things that are being ignored, and also housing. Housing, in spite of the fact that you know we're, we're not actually hearing enough about housing. I look, I was looking at um, the um, average income for employed New Zealanders, and off the top of my head, I think the lower quartile was twenty five thousand dollars a year. So, I mean, what does it cost to rent? a uh any type of even a room it's you know you're looking close to twenty five thousand dollars a year so those people must be living you know and that's you know that's before tax so these people aren't renting houses they must be living in cars vans sheds families fa yeah family uh, other family member homes yeah yeah and, and 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 we haven't had a lot of a discussion about that there are some interesting fractures that are growing, and I think the economic inequality of New Zealand is something that undermines social cohesion. And in the last decade, the wealth of the over 65s and the wealth of the under 35s, that, that division has doubled. And, and housing is an issue. And, you know, what's interesting is one of the things I'm looking at is what's called excess bedrooms. So I'm sitting in a, in a house on the North Shore. I have four bedrooms in my house. There are two of us, so we live in one bedroom. If you could release those bedrooms, we could actually solve our housing crisis at the moment. But I don't know what that mechanism would look like, and I don't hear what that mechanism 
looks like. So when I bought my first house, it was double my annual salary. And now it's nine times, you know, the average household income and the average cost of a house, the difference is nine. And, and how does anybody afford housing in New Zealand at the moment? Well, people do, but, you know, it's, it's, one, of, it's, it's one of those systems which appears to be broken, genuinely broken, and which we need to find different alternatives to. Now, housing supply is part of it, but what about other options? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it is important to recognise that the sheer cost of building a house, I think the most, one of the most, and this is, tiny houses are a great thing, like uh, it's a nice idea, but it's also extraordinarily depressing that tiny houses have emerged as a solution to the unaffordability of a house. Um, you know, to build a normal tiny house, that costs, just to build the house, that's not with land, that costs probably double the average salary um, of a New Zealander. And I think, you know, there's multiple reasons for the tiny house thing. Part of it is consenting, um, which is itself also really depressing. But, you know, it, just the cost of building is so high these days. It's, that's this additional cost on top of land as a speculative asset. Yes. And, and, and so housing, housing costs, why are we not doing more to understand why housing costs in New Zealand are so high compared to similar countries? Why don't we do more in terms of the cost of living? When you and I go to the supermarket, the cost of buying um, our regular meat, fruit, vegetables, whatever, why is that so expensive in New Zealand? Can we not address those sorts of issues? And when you look at the policy options, they tend to be quite narrow. And, and I don't have a problem in talking about GST coming off you know, some products. I mean, I think that that might be a way of addressing the issue. But then other political parties say, well, it actually doesn't reduce the cost at all. So what are we going to do to reduce or understand the costs and then and then reduce them so that people can get into the housing market? When you've got a when you've got a difference between household income and the cost of housing uh, to the factor of nine, it does suggest a major issue in terms of housing accessibility, housing affordability in this country. Where can people go to learn more? Like, you know, we've we've covered a lot of ground here, and we've obviously developed our opinions probably through presume probably through separate avenues. Um, one of my favourites, is, of course, interviews just like these. So. You know, where, where do you find, uh, where do you, how do you educate yourself? And also, where can people find the papers, that, the reports that you've referred to? Yes, the, the, the centre that was set up, um, and Sir Peter Gluckman was the one who set it up, but I'm, I've been involved in that, is called COI2. It's at the University of Auckland. It's called the Centre for Informed Futures. So it's one of those centres that produces papers regularly on a wide range of topics. So we've produced three papers on um, social cohesion. And so if people want to understand what we started this conversation with Arthur, then they can go to COI2. But they can also look at other environmental, political, social um, issues, and they can get information there. So I, I, I would strongly urge you to look at COI2, but there are other information sources that are around that would provide. I am a regular reader of things like The Conversation or The Spin-Off, so to get some views about things that are of importance to, to our society. Um, I really would encourage people to join organisations like U3A or to visit websites like yours, Arthur, so that you can be exposed to a range of views. You can be exposed to different views. Um, people can share information, but they can also share evidence. So I'm really strongly attached to what's the evidence? What does that evidence look like? Is it good evidence? So you very early on mentioned the Radio New Zealand example. We really need our institutions like the media to be checking information, to be fact-checking, to be filtering it, not in the sense of politically filtering it, but making sure it's, a, it, it, it's of a, um, a suitable quality to be made public. And, and we need 
I think to be accessing those information sources that have robust uh, processes for making sure that what they're providing to you and me is actually the best evidence. They should be making any bias they have clear so that, you know, I might not agree with that particular position, but I can read the paper knowing that they're, they're writing it from that particular position. So we just need good, rigorous uh, sources of information in this information age, in this digital age. And, and one final thing, we really do need to improve people's digital literacy. I work in an organization, a Whenua Kura, which is looking at how people get radicalized online. It's a really serious issue. And we really need those online, safe, um, online platforms to be safe and for people to engage in them so that they are not threatened, they are not hassled, they are not, um, they are not uh, experiencing vitriol or hate. Um, we need to have respect. You and I should be able to disagree. We should be able to have a conversation. Each of us should listen to the other. And even at the end, we can't agree. That's fine. But we've had the conversation and we're both better individuals for that. And that's really what social cohesion needs at its core that I will trust you and you will have a degree of trust in me. And I hope you have, Arthur. <laughs> well, I think we've taken a step yes. in the right direction, at least, Paul. Oh, I was sceptical initially, but I, I good, we've moved yes. forward. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time. It's been really, really enjoyable. I appreciate it. Lovely. Thank you, Arthur. I've enjoyed myself. Cheers, Paul. I had a lot of fun chatting with Paul. There was one addendum that I wanted to add, well, an extended addendum that I wanted to add uh, because we discussed media fact-checking in relation to the RNZ debacle, let's call it. When Paul says that our media institutions should be fact-checking, it's easy to respond to that with, well, okay, sure, but then who fact-checks the fact-checkers? This potential argument needs to be knocked on the head. By its very nature, media will always represent an opinionated viewpoint. Some of that opinion will be ideological, and some of it will be entertainment-based as these outlets try to drive their financial viability. Fact-checking will always take place inside that opinionated space, so it's just a part of the editorial process. That said, the statements made by the commercial media do need to be based on some kind of threshold of evidence. A highly visible recent example of this threshold for evidence being tested was the scandal that led to Johnny Depp's litigation against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. The whole thing came about because the British tabloid The Sun published a piece calling Depp a wife-beater. Depp sued the son's owners for libel, which is where you write something about someone that's untrue and hurts them in some way. He lost that case, though, which surprised a lot of lawyers. This was because the son's piece was entirely based on an opinion piece Amber Heard wrote for the Washington Post, in which she referred to herself as a victim of abuse. But referring to yourself as a victim of abuse is very different from calling your ex-husband a wife-beater. The Sun could not point to any other evidence that justified them calling Depp a wife beater. They made that leap because it would sell magazines. After the fact, Heard said that they were right, but that was after the story was published. It didn't actually add to, the, to their credibility. So Depp lost, but he was subsequently largely exonerated of claims of physical abuse in the US courts. It was very ugly. It's on Netflix. You can watch it if you want. And you know, this might be an ideal example or, or a bad example because the sun, the courts ruled with the sun and against Depp, but regardless, it, it has all the pieces there to have a discussion about fact-checking. And the next place this discussion naturally goes is fake news, but that's a digression that we'll have to wait for its own episode. Okay, so saying all this, in my view, fact-checking is not an appropriate response to what happened at RNZ. So what happened there and why is fact-checking not the solution? Well, there is a news industry 
that allows small news agencies like Stuff or RNZ or whoever to have international news without having to send their journalists around the world. Companies like Thomson Reuters or the Associated Press or the BBC allow other agencies to buy stories from them that they've produced or purchased from freelance journalists. This process is called syndication. In June of this year, an American who was for some reason reading RNZ saw a syndicated story about Ukraine that had Russian propaganda in it. They called out the originating agency, in this case Reuters, on Twitter. Reuters defended themselves, explaining that that was not their original text, that it had been changed somehow. And then this Kiwi guy, Dan Bruskill, took the two different stories and outlined the differences between them on Twitter. Great piece of citizen journalism. That led to RNZ launching an internal review. It turned out they had a person on staff whose job it was to copy paste these syndicated stories onto the website. This person was systematically editing these syndicated stories, and they had been doing it for a really long time. The total number of edited stories wasn't that high. It was around 20 from memory, maybe 15. Um, but regardless, this is crazy behavior. It's obviously the wrong thing to do, totally unjustifiable. Those words and articles are attributed to an author and a company. You can't just go changing what people say and then still putting their name on it and thinking you're going to get away with it. I mean, what's a media company supposed to do when you have crazy people there doing that stuff? Like have someone on staff double checking the copy pasting? It's excessive diligence. The person doing it was pretty much only inserting Russian propaganda about the Ukraine war. And what's remarkable about the whole affair is that it took so long to turn over. I mean, 15, 20 stories is not a lot of news stories in the scheme of things, but you'd think that after that many revisions, someone would notice the difference between the Reuters articles that are all over the world and the ones being published on RNZ. But no one did, not even through accidental rereading. It was only uncovered when some random overseas person noticed the pro-Russian tone and called out Reuters. It was ultimately discovered by accident because no one really reads the news critically, at least not the RNZ news. Or more accurately, people who care about the Ukraine war are not reading RNZ critically, except for someone in New York, apparently. Anyway, I don't think this event matters at all, really. Um, it's just a weird and interesting thing that happened. And RNZ shouldn't do anything about it because you know that no other news organization is double checking the copy pasting. It's, again, excessive diligence. The lesson here is the same one we get every single time there's a media scandal. Get your news from more than one source. Putting ourselves into the mindset of that surreptitious editor the US is the biggest market for English language news. So to serve that market, Reuters itself is likely to be publishing with a US ideological lens. So that undoctored story can be assumed to have been propaganda of a kind anyway. Anyway, the whole point is to say that yes, Paul is right, fact checking is good, but you should always assume that what you're reading is dodgy, because it basically, if it's the news, it basically always is. But fear not, because next episode, we are covering a subject that is so niche, it is out of the reach of propagandists. Eric Crampton is an economist at the New Zealand Initiative. He joins to talk about local government and the housing crisis. The whole conversation focuses on council debt limits and infrastructure funding, which might sound dry, but actually turns out to be really interesting. I'll see you all next week. Um, please like and subscribe because you're supposed to say it. It helps with conversions. Uh, and uh, if you're listening to this on Spotify, you can find it on YouTube with annotations and some you know, graphics put up, news clippings. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube and would like to listen to it in the car, well, you can do that on Spotify. Thanks, guys. Catch you next week.